Good morning, everyone. It's so nice to be here and to see such a nice turnout. Um, I'm going to focus on spasticity, which is something I see a lot of in my clinic, and I, something I'm very passionate about treating because it, it can really impair someone's life, and so treating it is very important. So the talk will be uh, split up into two halves. The first half, we're going to go over the definition of spasticity and some of the most common manifestations of it. And then the second half, we're going to talk about the treatment options that we have available to us. So how do we define spasticity? Very simply, spasticity is defined as an increased, increase in muscle tone or stiffness, or it's the sensation that patients or their caregivers will describe when they try to move a leg or an arm and it's just very stiff and they cannot move it. Um, some of the other common manifestations that patients will describe to me, other than just stiffness, is a jumping. And often this involves jumping of the foot or the leg. Patients will call it a tremor, but it's not really a tremor. It's more of a thumping movement. And oftentimes this thumping movement can be sustained and someone else has to come in and hold that, that joint or that leg in place for it to stop. The other common manifestation is cramping. And again, this cramping can be quite painful and quite sustained in nature. Um, the other things that patients will describe is flexion, where the limb will pull in towards the body. This can be ar the arm or the leg, um, or extension, where the limb will move away from the body. And again, these postures can be sustained and can definitely impair that person's life and the life of their care caregiver. So what are some of the common things um, that can cause spasticity? So anything that injures the brain or the spinal cord, okay? And the reason, and in the MS population, usually it's lesions in the spinal cord that will lead to spasticity. So why is that? So if you think about it, when things work normally, your brain thinks of a movement, or you may not even think of it, but the brain communicates using impulses, electrical impulses, down the spinal cord, through peripheral nerves, and to your muscle, and it allows that muscle to contract. If you have a lesion at the spinal cord level, that impulse is literally hitting a roadblock. Okay, and when it hits that roadblock, that the brain is no longer able to communicate with the muscle normally. And the muscle begins to do its own thing. It will begin to contract abnormally. All right, and without the brain to control it, it's not going to stop contracting. That's essentially what spasticity is. Um, so what are some of the common causes of spasticity? Everyone knows about stroke. It's a major injury to the brain, but also traumatic injuries to the brain or the spinal cord. If people remember Christopher Reeve, he fell off a horse, he hurt his spinal cord. And again, he was quadriplegic and probably had a degree of spasticity as well, if I had to guess. In the pediatric population, the most common cause is cerebral palsy. And again, as these children get older, the this, this spasticity carries through to their adult life. In the MS population, as Dr. Shin had alluded to, we have 400,000 patients, give or take, living with MS in the United States. 68% of these patients have spasticity, and approximately 38% of this population will have spasticity that impairs their life or is problematic in nature. So it's quite common. This picture is actually a picture of a child who has cerebral palsy. Um, and as you can see, you don't need a degree to figure out that his posture is not normal, right? His hips are flexed. His knees are bent, and he's actually trying to walk on his toes or on the balls of his feet, all right? And the reason for that is certain muscles in his legs, he might have a degree of weakness, but certain muscles are also overly contracted. They're working a little too hard. Specifically with him, it's his hip flexors. It's the hamstrings that are in the back of your thigh. They're pulling in his knee. And then also the calf muscles are overly, overly contracted, which is why he's walking on his toes or on the balls of his feet. So the goal with treating spasticity is sort of to treat, to relax those overactive muscles, to calm them down a little bit, so the muscles that are actually strong are able to do their job. This picture shows the arm, and it's nice how they did this. They're dividing it up into the different sections of the arm, so you have the elbow. Clearly, the elbow is bent, um, and if someone's elbow is constantly bent, they can't reach out for anything. The other, the other thing that this picture may not be clear in showing is the shoulder is actually stuck against the chest wall. It's like this. So this person can't do this, all right? Again, will impair their ability to reach out, but it will also impair their ability to clean in this area. And we're going to get into why some of the other reasons why it's important to treat spasticity. Um, the other few pictures will show the wrist in flexion like this, and the hand, is the, the, hand the, the fingers are sort of flexed in. They're pushing into the palm, and that person is unable to open the hand. Clearly, it's going to impair the ability to clean. Sometimes it's, the, the tightness is so severe that the, that the nails begin to dig into that person's skin, 
and can actually begin to cut into the palm. And the other thing is, without, if you can't open your hand, you can't grasp anything. You can't grasp a utensil to eat. You can't write. You can't grasp onto the walker or to the cane in order to support yourself. Okay. This picture I like, this is something we call a hitchhiker's toe. Um, it's someone's foot. As you can see, the big toe is pointed upwards. Not only can this lead to maceration of the tip of the toe, but also these people can wear out, um, they can wear out a hole at the top of their shoe. And so they'll, they'll go through pairs of shoes very, very frequently. And again, this, again, these postures can be painful. That's another reason. So why is it important to treat spasticity? So skin integrity, I touched on this before with the flexed hand. Um, clearly, if, if skin is constantly rubbing against other skin, the skin will begin to break down. Not only is that painful, but it's a nidus for infection, something that we know can be very detrimental to a patient with MS, can lead to a, to a pseudo exacerbation. Um, but also you have bacterial overgrowth in that area and it leads to malodor, which can be embarrassing for some people. Um, moving on. Bone and joint integrity is also very important. So the thing that we ultimately want to prevent in treating spasticity is something called a contracture. Contractures occur when if a joint is constantly held in a certain position, that joint will literally get stuck in that position. And no matter how many oral medications or how many injections I throw at you, it's not gonna, they're not gonna work. The only thing that can work for a contracture is surgical tendon release. And even there, there's no guarantee that it will not recur. And again, we wanna avoid major interventions like surgery when at all possible. Um, the other reason it's important to treat spasticity, again, if a joint is constantly stuck in one position, you can actually have inflammation of that joint or in, in, inflammation of the capsule. And oftentimes patients who have upper extremity spasticity or lower extremity spasticity will come in saying, you know, my hip really hurts or my shoulder really hurts because they've developed frozen shoulders. And not only is it spasticity impairing the movement, but it's just the pain from that inflammation that also impairs their ability to move, okay? Nerve impingement is also very important to prevent. Again, if your hand or your wrist is constantly like this, your median nerve runs across your wrist. And if you, com if you constantly compress that median nerve, you're gonna, you're gonna have carpal tunnel syndrome, okay? Same thing with ulnar neuropathies, where your ulnar nerve runs across here, and if you're constantly like, like this and putting pressure on that nerve, that can lead to something like a tennis elbow. Um, personal care. So if you remember, we go back to that first picture of that child. Oops, I'm going forward, sorry. So this picture, personal care, his, thighs are constantly stuck together. This person cannot open their legs. They can't open their legs to clean themselves, they, and their caregiver certainly can't open their legs if they need to be catheterized. Um, it impairs their ability to go to the toilet. The other thing is it can also impair intimate relations with your partner, okay? Okay. Some of the other reasons why it's important to treat spasticity, sleep disruption. Um, for whatever reason, spasms typically get worse at night, in my experience. That's what patients report. If you can't find a comfortable position to fall asleep in, or you're constantly having spasms that can be painful, clearly, you're not going to get a good night's rest. And we all know that MS, MS comes with fatigue. It's something that goes along with the disease. If you don't get enough rest, you're adding to that fatigue, okay? Weight loss, and this is something I wasn't aware of until I really started to treat spasticity, but I always wondered why, why do people who have such profound spasticity, why do they always look underweight? And I thought, well, maybe they're not eating, maybe they have a lack of appetite, but it's actually the spasticity that itself that leads to the weight loss. Spasticity can be incredibly calorically demanding. And so when you begin to treat the spasticity, these patients begin to regain some of that weight and they look healthy. Um, body image, incredibly important. I've had patients who've come in and said, you know, I don't like going out anymore. I don't like going out to restaurants. I don't like going out to a movie. I don't like doing anything because I'm so embarrassed by the way I look. I had a patient who had a gunshot injury to his back and his spinal cord. Profound spasticity affecting the lower extremities. And he said, my, my spasms are so severe that I will lose continence of my bowel and bladder. And this actually happened to me while he was in clinic. Um, Again, another very important reason to treat spasticity. We need, you know, patients need to have a social life. It's important, it's important for all of us. Okay, so factors which can exacerbate spasticity. Uh, interestingly, these are very similar factors that can exacerbate MS and can lead to relapses. So infections, especially UTIs, can certainly make muscles tighter. 
pressure sores, ingrown toenails, constipation can make spasticity worse, tight-fitting tight clothing or ill-fitting orthotics when your AFO is just too tight to get on your ankle, that can worsen the spasticity itself as well. Stress or emotion can certainly do it. And then temperature fluctuations, either it's too hot or it's too cold. So whenever I see someone in clinic, there are a couple of things I need to address, and this also involves um, involving the caregiver. So one, one is to identify if that person really has spasticity, and that just takes a good history and exam. And then once we figure out if that person has spasticity, I wanna ask, how do you think it's impairing your life? What, how does this affect you? And once I can figure that out, I can also set a certain goal. Again, it has to be a realistic goal, but then we can work towards that goal together, and it can be done one step at a time. We may not be able to solve, you know, if, if just like that child, if we go back. I may not be able to work on the entire leg in one session, but if we can pick one goal, let's say it's trying to extend out those knees, all right, that's something we can do and we can do it one at a time. Once we've accomplished that, let's try to get your heels back on the ground, okay? Or let's try to get your legs more open. So one goal at a time. Okay. And again, the goal of treatment is ultimately to improve your quality of life and the quality of life of your loved ones and caregivers. That's what we're trying to do. So some of the treatment options that we have available to us. So I'm sure most of you have heard of these medications or have been on these medications. These are the oral medications that we have in our toolkit that are um, uh, aimed to decrease muscle tone. So baclofen is very common, tizanidine, cyclobenzaprine or flexoril, dantrolene, the benzodiazepine. So this class of medications will include Ativan, clonazepam, um, Valium, and then clonidine. So these medications typically work well. The thing that limits these medications is that they have, because you're taking them orally or by mouth, they have a systemic effect, okay? And because of that, let's say you just have spasticity affecting the right leg. Well, again, these medications may not just work on the right leg. They may cause overall weakness. And that person may already be prone to weakness from, from the MS. They can worsen cognition or, cog or worsen cognitive impairment. They can also worsen someone's balance. So again, there are some limitations to these medications, although they are usually first line for, for spasticity. So some of the procedures that we have, so the injections. There are nerve blocks, and if we go to the next cartoon, you can see that, um, where's my pointer? So this is a nerve block, and so you have your spinal cord here. The nerve comes off of the spinal cord and communicates with the muscle, which is here. The nerve block will work, obviously, on the nerve. It's usually a mixture of, of an anesthetic and sometimes steroids. The problem with nerve blocks is that they don't last very long. They last maybe a few minutes to a few hours. Um, the other very commonly used thing is fe are phenol injections. Phenol injections can actually be given directly to the nerve or they can be given to the muscle. The nice thing about phenol injections is that they can last up to 36 months. They're very long lasting. The problem with phenol injections is that they can lead to circulatory and tissue damage at the site that the injections are given. So it's not something we commonly will use at Georgetown. Something we are very familiar with at Georgetown are botulinum toxin injections. The other name for this is Botox, okay? So Botox, this is the same medication that's given in people's faces to get rid of the wrinkles. And the reason that it does that is that basically if this is your nerve and this is your muscle, the nerve has to communicate with that overtight muscle. Once you give Botox, it disrupts that communication between the nerve and the muscle and allows that muscle to, to relax. Um, and that's exactly what's, what it's doing to people's wrinkles, and that's why the muscle relaxes and the wrinkles smooth away. This is um, someone giving Botox in clinic. Um, the, so the nice thing about Botox and the nice thing about these injections is that they're very focal in their effect. They don't have that systemic effect that the oral medications will have. Um, so this is a person giving Botox into someone's legs. The two electrodes that you see here and here, it's not there to shock you, it's just, um, it's there to pick up your muscle activity. So we can hear your muscle and we know exactly that we're in muscle and it's the muscle that we want to go into, the muscle that is over tight, okay? Um, other than the, fo the focal effect of Botox, the other nice thing is that um, the duration of action is approximately three months. Um, once we build up on the dose, uh, sometimes the, the effect can last up to four to five months. And, but again, to build up to that optimal dosing takes time, all right? 
The other form of treatment that we're very familiar with at Georgetown are intrathecal baclofen pumps. Um, so this is a pump. It looks like a hockey puck, and that's about the size of it. Um, these pumps contain liquid baclofen. So this is different from the baclofen that you take orally. The baclofen that you're taking orally is in milligrams. Liquid baclofen comes in micrograms, so it's about one one-thousandth the dose. And you would think, well, it's less, it's less potent. How does it work? How, why would it work better? The reason that it works better is that this liquid baclofen is going directly into the space that surrounds the spinal cord. So it's going directly into where the problem is. And that's how it works better, I think, than, than just oral baclofen. Um, so this pump, we'll go to the other side. This pump is implanted here, right here, or maybe on this side. Sometimes it's also implanted in the back area. Um, but there's a little catheter that comes out of the pump, and that's represented in the red here. Um, and it snakes its way up into the spinal cord. And it, it can be put at different levels, but typically it's in the lower part of the spinal cord. And because of that, it really has a profound effect on patients who have spasticity affecting the legs, all right? Um, the nice thing about the intrathecal baclofen pump is that we can communicate with it. So once it's implanted under the skin, you would come to our office, we would put a little remote control looking device, and we can talk to the pump. We can go up and down on the dose. We can add boluses, let's say, for instance, you have more spasms at night. Well, we can give you an extra squirt of baclofen at night, okay, to get rid of those spasms and make you sleep comfortably. Um, the other thing that uh, we don't talk about as much is that sometimes people who have bladder um, incontinence because their bladder keeps spasming, sometimes the baclofen can also improve that. Um, and just going back, one last point about the baclofen. Because it's a little reservoir, I like to compare it to a little tank of gas. It eventually will run out, and once it runs out, you will have to come in for refills. Okay? And the last point I wanted to touch on um, is physical and occupational therapy. These, uh, our physiatrists, our physical therapists are so crucial in what we do. We work together with them. The goal is, yes, we can do the medications, we can do the injections, we can do the baclofen, but we need to work together with them because they're ultimately the ones that will help strengthen and stretch uh, the muscles. Um, but they're also important for other reasons. They help with gait, they help with balance, they can help patients with their activities of daily living, especially occupational therapists, um, in the sense that if you have, let's say you have a, a disability involving the hand or the arm, they will try to work with that disability to get, the mo to get you to get the most out of your life. Um, oh, and that's it. Thank you.